Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjunginlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian Life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst in Cape Cod. Today, we are going to talk about gullibility. And what is it? How does it work? Let's see what we can do to to understand some of this. Gullibility by basically by definition is an unusual tendency to be duped uh, or somehow taken advantage of. And it, it involves action of doing something, giving something, going somewhere uh, as a result of, of coercion, uh, which makes it a little bit uh, different from just being credible or having credulity and believing something. We act on something as a result of being persuaded. It takes place in the wider social, political, religious, family arenas that we all live in and that we're all part of. It takes place socially because we're social creatures. Maybe we haven't thought things through or you know, we have an attachment to a person or an organization, or maybe we're just tired or had a drink or two too many. But all those play a part in gullibility and, and being taken advantage of in a way that makes us act unwisely and that we may later say, oh my God, you know, what was I thinking? So what are we thinking? Well, Deb, you were talking about various states that might induce gullibility. And I'm thinking about the role that a paranoid outlook can play when we're relating to the world in a paranoid fashion, where we're looking behind every lamppost for an evildoer. We are likely to be taken in easily by any number of conspiracy theories or implications that there might be some, you know, grand plan out there to do us wrong or, or do harm to those we love. So I, I, I find that curious, that paranoia seems to be one stance that can get us in trouble in this way. So uh, really our very uh, vigilance has this uh, backlash and can do us in yeah, I think paranoia goes beyond vigilance. And I'm I'm trying to think about exactly how I would describe it. But paranoia is, I think it's sort of like when you project your shadow onto the larger world and it's all out there and it's lurking behind every bush. So maybe gullibility has something to do with shadow and how we relate to shadow. Because, you know, Jung said that knowing your own darkness is the best method for dealing with the darkness of other people. I'm going to say that again because I think it's so profound. Knowing your own darkness is the best method for dealing with the darkness of other people. 
That's a quote from Jung, and he's talking about shadow. And I think it's very relevant to this discussion of gullibility. Absolutely. And to the degree that we know our own shadow, that we carry a kind of authority into the world and an ability to recognize other people's shadow. If I refuse to see my own capacity to be cunning, for instance, and I actively and consistently work to suppress or oppress that knowledge in myself, then I'm going to be in a state of denial when I see cunning behavior in others. And that makes me much more vulnerable. I'm thinking around this idea of paranoia that there are several televangelists who have developed apocalyptic food buckets. <laughs> it's actually a market. So there's this enormous amount of energy that spins up doomsday, end of world apocalypse horrors. And then a little bit later in the show, people can purchase buckets with life preservers and food supplies so that when the end days come, that you'll have a couple of meals and a way to float, uh, which is like kind of a perfect gullibility dynamic that's been fostered by paranoia. Right. That sort of end times stuff is in very much in the realm of sort of a paranoid psychology, I want to say. It, it almost goes beyond fear because it's, it's really uh, kind of encompasses everything. And, and I think it does make us very vulnerable to gullibility. Yeah, because we feel like we're protecting ourselves by getting everything that we think we need, whether, I don't know if this is still as prevalent, but back in the 30s and 40s for Mormons, the end of days was very, very real. And so people had doomsday sellers and two years worth of canned food that they would rotate around because it was a sure thing that was going to happen. We see the gun industry doing a similar thing, creating a kind of paranoid feeling about the culture and that everyone, and now even children in Texas, are being encouraged and legally allowed to have unlimited access to all kinds of weapons. So our paranoia, once it's stoked, is then easily captured by this capitalizing and a kind of marketing so that people can extract our money from us. And, and that's happened in fairy tales. Uh, it's the beginning of time that the cunning fox is able to get out of your pocket um, whatever it wants, as long as it can get into your emotions and spin you in a particular direction. And then there's all of this confirmation bias. Once we're upset about something, it's very easy to want to run after a solution to relieve our distress rather than actually solve a problem. So I just want to kind of close that loop by coming back to this idea about shadow. When fear is being stoked, when, when a paranoid uh, state is being inculcated, say, by someone who's ginning us up, then uh, what's happening there is we're being encouraged essentially to project shadow out into the world, that the world is a scary place, that someone's coming to get us, that terrible things are going to happen, and it's all out there. So I'm, I'm wondering if we can sort of track as we talk about different ways that we might be gullible, if we can sort of tie it to this notion of how we relate to shadow. You know, the understanding being that if we're really conscious of our shadow and we're in relationship to it, I think it will make us less gullible. And Joseph, I think you really hit on uh, an important point when you talked about how various kinds of persuaders, let's call them to be uh, decent about it, uh, play on our emotions. They may play on our fear and need to protect ourselves. They can play on our need. They can play on greed. They can play on just uh, innocence. I mean, the, the con man famously uh, offers a friendship and alliance and kind of helpfulness of, I may help you get ahead in some way. It does play on our emotions. 
And that can override uh, sort of common sense kinds of things like, you know, check it out. Uh, <laughs> even something as, as sort of ordinary and simple as going on Wikipedia or consulting a friend or a knowledgeable source who doesn't have a stake in it. Just maybe delaying the action step so that you have 24 hours or something to think it over. Checking your intuition, watching body language of uh, all those things where we can enlist cognitive and external world sources rather than just acting out of emotion. And I think this desire to have our anxiety relieved is so powerful. And it was one of Freud's very early discoveries is that the ego will create all kinds of creative and sometimes strange ways to trick our nervous system so that we're not anxious about something. And the anxiety may be justified or not. And the great example for Freud was many irrational religious beliefs that life is very difficult in a very real way. And how do we still move forward with all of these kind of existential horrors? So whether the finger bone of a saint is going to prevent you and your family from getting plague, and that gives you at least enough of a feeling of courage that you can have a life and not just be in a state of constant horror. And yet it can make us foolhardy as we kind of move down through the mm -hmm. local medieval village, being sure that we've now been protected by the mm -hmm. left pinky of St. Teresa and finding out that that's not particularly helpful. But there's all kinds of ways that we submit to things rather than confront the anxiety that comes up, as you were saying, Deb, from mm -hmm. just getting facts. Yeah. And though we like to say that reality is medicinal and facts are friendly, we do have to go through a process of integrating the correct information and rising to the challenge that reality makes a demand upon us. But I wonder if these two things go, if they, we have two big categories, that one of them is staving off uh, fearfulness, but the other is going moving into something that we think will be a really, really good deal, uh, that we want something. You know, we want it to be more beautiful and you know, this, this magic elixir will, you know, make us smarter, more attractive, richer. Uh, the list goes on and on. Mm -hmm. So that there's a going toward as well as a staving, staving off. Right. So there's desire. Yes. And there were some awful um, stories of these uh, domestic servants in Hollywood who also wanted to participate in various kinds of lip plumping and uh, facial sculpting methods and nefarious people who would develop kind of concoctions mm. on their own and inject them into these poor people at some high cost because there was a promise that you too are going to become kind of Hollywood beautiful. And these horrible, horrible, sometimes life-threatening damage that were being done to these poor women in the promise that they will become as beautiful as the people in their environment. So there is absolutely something about having just a heart wrenchingly intense need being verbal about that, by the way, speaking it into the community. And then again, the foxes of the world kind of show up. Well, and Joseph, you used a really important word a little while ago that I wrote down to come back to, and that's marketing. Mm -hmm. Because I think that, you know, the foxes of the world have always been there, but it's become part of the culture, marketing, advertising. And of course, that's not to say that all marketing is, you know, evil and nefarious. It's, it's not true at all. However, the modern development of the advertising industry is a lot about exactly what we've been talking about, tapping into people's emotions, connecting with fears, 
connecting with desires and creating new fears and desires, by the way, in order to convince people that they have to have a product. And this is now so much a part of our everyday life that we somewhat just take it for granted. You know, in a way, this goes to uh, what I understand as the two big nodal points in Buddhism of fear and desire. Advertising preys on our desires, and we've been talking also about how to stave off fears. Well, I think advertising preys on our fears, too. Yes, it's, but it does go to those two nodal points, doesn't it? And so we could say that fears, irrational fears, as well as our unmet needs, as well as not being in touch with our own shadow, creates this tragic trifecta mm-hmm. that can send us out into the world in this state of willful ignorance <laughs> and gullibility. So let's look at just what you said, Joseph. That was a great summary. And let's look at The Emperor's New Clothes, which is a wonderful fairy tale about gullibility. So I think everyone knows that story. There's a vain king who wants to be seen as uh, the most sophisticated and the best dressed monarch in the land. So right away, there's this susceptibility because of this, this desire. He wants to be admired. He has a deep desire to be admired. We could say that the king has some narcissistic wounds. And two uh, foxes, trickster tailors, allegedly tailors, come present themselves and say that they can make the most beautiful, most uh, finest, richest cloth, uh, but only those people who are truly intelligent can see it. So it's kind of magical cloth. And then they spend all of this time, it's very charming, they spend all of this time carefully spinning and weaving, supposedly, something that no one can see. And so minister after minister comes to check on their progress. And they say, oh, it's coming along beautifully. Can't you see? And every minister says, oh, why, yes, I've never seen anything. Look at it. Look at the way that it shines in the light. Look at the, the delicate drape of the fabric be- because they, they don't want to reveal themselves as being stupid. And at last, the suit of clothes is ready and the king wears them and processes through the village completely naked. <laughs> And uh, everyone's ooing and aahing and exclaiming because no one wants to admit that they can't see it. So again, we're talking about another desire, a desire to be seen as adequate, a fear of inadequacy, perhaps. Everyone adopts it. So finally, a little child says, but he hasn't got any clothes on. And that, of course, is the turning point in the story when everyone realizes what's happened and everyone comes back down to his or her senses. So it's a wonderful story about how our desire for something, our fear of inadequacy, our need to belong even, uh, can be manipulated uh, so that we become, we believe something that doesn't make any sense. I, I think the need to belong is actually something that can be a big motivator for gullibility. Well, I think part of what I'm thinking about is over the course of my life, how new fashions or hairstyles will show up that are perhaps radically new. For instance, the first time, this was probably in the late 80s, early 90s, that I started seeing people show up with bright blue hair or bright pink hair. And it was part (laughs) of this kind of punk rock movement that was slowly coming over from uh, England with the new wave music scene. And I remember thinking, that is just untenable. That, it's just unworkable. Just, like, who would possibly <laughs> dye your hair blue? It's, just, it's beyond the ken. And I remember just feeling uncomfortable uh, kind of seeing it. And then lo and behold, here we are. And I'm seeing some lovely girl at the checkout counter with bright pink hair. And now I think, oh, that's so cute. <laughs> so, so how does that happen? Yeah. How does it, how, do we get swept into something that becomes kind of culturally approved of mm-hmm. or, or culturally valued? 
Mm-hmm. And it speaks to how powerful that normalizing energy is. And that once there's, I suspect, a kind of critical mass in the collective. Yes. That all of a sudden, yeah. it seems like yeah. everybody feels, this is great. It's a, it's a perfectly reasonable idea. And hair is a really easy thing because dyeing your hair blue doesn't hurt anybody. So it's not an issue of enormous concern. But that's a big shift of attitude that happened without a conscious choice on my part. So I have a story to map on to the fairy tale. When I was probably in seventh or eighth grade, we had a teacher where came into class one day and she said, so we're going to do a taste test and see how many of you can tell the difference between spring water and tap water. So each of you has two classes in front of you or paper cups or whatever. The one on the left is spring water and the one on the right is tap water. And so we were all, you know, drinking the water. And of course I'm thinking, ah, I will be able to tell the difference. I, I know my water, you know. The first few kids kind of piped up and said, up oh, the one on the left is the spring water. I'm tasting them and I can't, I'm not really sure, but I think, yeah, I think, I think it's true. I think the one on the left is the spring water. And so lo and behold, seven tenths of the class or something all agreed that the one on the left was the spring water. And I think you probably can probably can guess what, what was happening. They were both the same. They were both tap water. But the teacher had asked the first, say, five students to say that the one on the left was tap water so that it it shaped everyone else's opinion. And, and you think to yourself, well, I don't want to be wrong. I mean, it was exactly like the emperor's new clothes. I'm sitting there. I think, well, gosh, I don't want to reveal my ignorance. So I'm going to go with the kind of majority opinion. So I was duped. I was gullible. When my senses could have told me these are the same thing, I overrode my desire to be seen as, I, I want to say, sort of like everyone else, overrode the evidence of my senses, mm-hmm. just like in the fairy tale. So we're really circling around how powerful uh, the need to belong uh, is, how persuadable we are, uh, whether it's uh, dyeing your hair pink or blue. And once it sort of becomes normalized, then that's fine. Also, I'm aware, Lisa, in your example, that the teacher, you know, did something pretty deceptive. She had some some plants uh, in in the class who would uh, aver that uh, the water on the left was the spring water. So, you know, a little bit of a con game there. To prove a point. And I have not forgotten it. This was a long time ago, but I remember it. You know what, though? I am um, aware of maybe two lessons. One is you know, the, the lesson about not overriding your own experience and your own sensate uh, information. But the other is your kids, and there is a certain amount of innocence and naivete uh, that children have that I don't think they can be faulted for. And uh, this experiment was not entirely honest. But I have an example of my own gullibility that I can't resist. When we were kids on a rainy day, other kids would come over and we played some kind of card game. And one of the kids who was about a year older, you know, all of a sudden piped up and said, hey, you know what? Hey, Deb, you want to play 52 pickup? And I said, yeah, how do you play that? And he said, here, I'll show you. And of course, he he sprinkled up, uh, bent the cards and then splayed them all over the room. And he said, okay, now you have to pick up all 52 cards. And everybody laughed and I laughed and I picked up all 52 cards. And some time went on and we did something else. And then he said, hey, who wants to play 104 pickup? And I said, how do you play 104 pickup? (laughs) (laughs) And I was old enough to know better, I think. (laughs) Going back for a second to uh, our our discussion about shadow and and this, this word that you brought up, Deb, about innocence, I think that we can kind of get trapped in our own perception of our innocence that is a kind of denial of our shadow. I mean, Joseph, you mentioned this before, if we don't know our own 
propensity, for example, to be cunning, we will really have a really hard time spotting cunning in other people. Mm -hmm. So really knowing like, oh yeah, that person could do me a dirty turn because I could imagine doing a dirty turn to someone else. It's an important thing to realize. It's an important mm -hmm. thing to claim our shadow, to know it. And it's partly developmental, but there are plenty of adults who deny their own capacity for any wrongdoing and therefore get themselves in trouble all the time because they don't see that someone else might be kind of out to get them. You know, an interesting uh, corollary to this is uh, crows. People who study corvids will say that corvids have a theory of mind, that they're able to put themselves in someone else's shoes, so to speak, another crow's shoes, so to speak, because crows will cache food. And what they learn is that if, so they'll hide food. So if you're a, a young crow and you hide your nut, another crow who sees you may come along and take that nut because he saw you hiding it. After that happens to you a few times as a crow, you find the nut you pretend to hide it when another crow is looking, but you don't really hide it. Then you go off somewhere alone and hide it. And so they've noticed that this is something that crows learn to do after they've been burned a few times and they start stealing the other crow's food. So it's, it's recognizing that you could be in that position where you could do someone else a dirty turn that helps you protect yourself against someone else's potential malfeasance against you. The other thing which is so wonderful is that the crows kind of accept reality. It's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> yes. my stuff's been stolen three times. And in this wonderfully clear way, the crow figures out, I should try something different. <laughs> but humans, humans will often not do that. <laughs> that <laughs> They'll keep doing it <laughs> over and over again. Because the crow that steals it will make a story about it. <laughs> I didn't right. really steal your nut. God required that nut or, <laughs> you know, or whatever the story is. And that's exactly what I didn't do in my facetious example of the card game of uh, that. We have to have our sense of trust uh, sort of punctured. Yes, yes. And that's what happens with the crows. And I think it has as part of growing up that our innocence and, and unwitting trust yeah you know, has to be tempered uh, by some of these kinds of experiences, even betrayals. Well, it's fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Yes, exactly. Know? But when we're into adulthood and we're still clinging to this overly innocent view of ourselves or other people, something's not happening that needed to happen. You know, we like Joseph, like you're saying, we have to accept reality and, and own a little of our own cunningness. So because historically human beings have depended upon face-to-face -face communication, person-to-person -person gossip, information that comes to us from whispers and personal retellings, there was no other way that we could get information. Consequently, people who were caught lying or slandering were punished terribly, and sometimes even stoned to death, because the effect on the tribe could be so damaging and dangerous, because we really depended on people giving us accurate information. Nowadays, you know, we have so many overwhelmingly different places to go, ostensibly, to get a stream of new information that that can be a little bit more overwhelming, but in our bones, I think we're still designed to believe what's spoken to us. Mm -hmm. that we haven't evolved beyond that survival mechanism. And part of that, I want to say from a psychoanalytic standpoint is that belief systems are metaphoric representations of our parents. And when we ascribe a kind of parental authority to an idea, that it releases us from responsibility, which is incredibly seductive. So the inner child in all of us longs for assistance and support 
depends upon the parents to provide explanations. And this makes us tremendously vulnerable to giving away our authority and our capacity to really test if something is true. And this is really blood curdlingly unpacked in Eric Fromm's book, Escape from Freedom, which is a very chilling psychoanalytic analysis of the way in which human beings reject self-responsibility, which includes discovering as far as we can, what is true and what is not true and how easily human beings will give away their power to know what's true in order to regress back to a child state. And that is, is part of this pernicious gullibility. Yeah, that was, that was really, really well said, Joseph. And there's something about the complexity of modern life that we need some authority at some point to tell us what's right. We can't be independently responsible for knowing, for example, you know, the right thing to do in every case. We have to trust in some authorities to say, well, vaccines really are working because I'm not a virologist and I'm, I'm not a, an expert in vaccines. So how am I to know what's, what's true? I have, to, I have to appeal to some authority. And then the question is, what authority am I going to listen to? But if you think about all the thousands of daily decisions we make about what we eat, what we do, how we invest, what we spend our money on, and each of those has uh, uh, important implications for our lives or our communities or the planet, and making a decision about any of these things requires just tons of, of information and could be almost infinitely complex. So at some point we need an authority we can trust to say, you know, it's okay. You can, uh, you can take this medicine. This is, this is safe. This isn't going to have bad side effects or whatever it is. So I think we, we've kind of created these institutions in a sense to guard against this pernicious vulnerability. But then what happens when people lose faith in those institutions? Mm -hmm. It's that famous phrase that goes all around that when people are too lazy to think, then they just judge. That was actually attributed to Jung, but apparently he actually isn't the one who quite uh, said that. But there's truth to it anyway, that thinking takes a lot of energy. And sitting down even for a half hour and just really going to the National Institute of Health and then the Mayo Clinic and maybe several other places that have at least some history of providing accurate scientific information. And as you said, extending some amount of credibility to institutions and people who have demonstrated a history of providing credible, useful information and allowing that to come in and change how we perceive something would be the smarter thing to do, would be using our thinking function. But many human beings, and this is actually related to levels of education, quite frankly, many people who have not been supported in developing a rigorous thinking function are then guided by feelings and their emotions, the emotion of letting go to an authority figure who reminds them of their parents or letting go to a, an authority figure because they've wrapped their veracity in a certain religious tone exposes people to all kinds of terrible risks, terrible risks. But we have to own the fact that it takes a lot of energy to critically think. Somehow I am taking a turn uh, into the topic of trauma and how that affects our tendency to be gullible. And that relational trauma, and there is a lot of it, um, as well as overt forms of trauma, Instead of inspiring uh, this kind of healthy uh, skepticism, desire to fact check, etc., infuses people often uh, with 
was such a profound sense of self-doubt uh, that they don't trust uh, their decisions and their perceptions uh, and are vulnerable to uh, various kinds of authority figures in a quest for safety. And that takes uh, your idea, Joseph, about regression uh, to a different place, a kind of profound insecurity and a need uh, for support and veracity from someone who seems uh, credible. And I think there, you know, we're all carrying in a way some level of this in today's world. And maybe it's too much to say that it's trauma, but Lisa, your example of, you know, we're not virologists or infectious disease specialists or a hundred other things. And so um, our anxiety really does lead us into various kinds of beliefs, authority figures, uh, something. It, it's a real issue and, and not just something where, oh, the person just didn't check out the facts. And it's difficult that in today's world, we don't know who to believe and we don't trust institutions and find safe harbor in other places. Building on your topic around trauma and gullibility, I was thinking, and we see this in our practice all the time, how people who are traumatized in order to survive the trauma wind up being alienated from their instincts. Because often the traumatogenic environment or the parent or the authority figure is providing a worldview that is false, but it becomes so dangerous for the child to disagree with the falsehood that they have to learn to abandon their own instincts in favor of aligning with the more powerful yet damaging and abusing system or person. So when that becomes a habit of survival, even many decades later when people are in more benign circumstances, they've gotten away from the terrible circumstance they were in, they still don't trust or have access to their own instincts, which would give them at least some kind of gut sense of whether or not they're in danger or whether or not they're considering something that's going to harm them because they've been subjected to harm for a long time and told that this isn't harm. Really well said. And I think it's so important, the word you used, instincts, because instincts are a good antidote to excessive gullibility. It's our instincts that will alert us when something's wrong. And if we can't hear those instincts, then we really are in danger. And I'll, I'll throw a fairy tale into the mix of, uh, I mean, there's many I could pick from, but given, given the context of trauma, I'll talk about Snow White. So Snow White, of course, had uh, an evil stepmother. Actually, in the original Grimm's, it was her mother who was very envious of her and wanted her dead because she saw her as a rival and she she goes away and uh, lives with the seven dwarves who want to protect her. So the dwarves can be seen as an image of her kind of earthy instincts. And when they leave the house to go to work in the morning, they say, whatever you do, don't open the door. Well, there comes a knock at the door and Snow White opens it. And there's a little old lady who's selling combs, I think. The, the woman says, oh, you'll be really beautiful with this comb. So there's desire again and an inability to relate to her own cunning and wounded instincts. And she buys the comb and she puts it in her hair and she falls down and the dwarves rescue her. And the dwarves say, that must have been your mother in disguise. Don't answer the door. And a week later, someone answers the door and it's a little old woman and she's selling laces and Snow White, the idiot, <laughs> buys the laces again. And then finally, of course, it's the apple, which half of which is poison, which, which really uh, lifts this up into a different archetypal realm because then we're dealing with sexuality and temptation. So it's a very, very 
rich tale. But in terms of this issue of trauma and gullibility, she did not know how to protect herself. She was so innocent in in a way that was really, um, in spite of the fact that she had been so violated, I, I think we can see it as a story of trauma. She her, her innocence was just so complete that she couldn't imagine that this evil woman was had it out for her. And and so it's a it's a really beautiful, robust story, I think, about innocence and trauma and gullibility. You know, I'd like to take a look at the flip side of this and see where it takes us with Jack and the Beanstalk. Because uh, Jack, uh, who's supposed to go and sell the cow, which uh, will be able to buy food and so on for the family, uh, very gullibly uh, sells the cow for a handful of magic beans. And his mother is so angry, of course, that he's made such a terrible bargain that she throws them out the window and then comes the beanstalk and the rest of the story that eventually results in a good outcome. Very good outcome. In fact, they go from having a cow that will no longer give any milk to a goose that lays a golden egg every day. Mm -hmm. So a real image of ongoing abundance and wealth, inner wealth. So was Jack gullible? Because in fact, the beans were magic. (laughs) And yet the deal he made... You know, was there a wise child in there who had some real instincts that said, uh, hey, I'm going to go for it. I think this is I think this is a good idea. Or, Or was he simply gullible and he lucked out? And such an important distinction between uh, when you take a chance and when you take a risk that could really pay great dividends and when it's a bad idea. Uh, as we all know, with somebody like Bernie Madoff, for example, who swindled I don't know how many people out of millions and millions of dollars. How do we know? And that is that is the million-dollar question. You know, I'm thinking about people who were looking at cryptocurrency a couple of years ago and now have you know $100 million in oh Bitcoin gosh. because it was, it was <laughs> pennies. You know, per coin initially, how did they how did they know that cryptocurrency was going to be the magic beans of this generation that was going to open these incredible doors? I've had circumstance to talk to a few people who did ride that wave to massive wealth, and they somehow were able to see the vision on the other side of this cryptocurrency, that there was a philosophy behind it that made sense to them. That was both a kind of political philosophy in terms of decentralizing currency. There was some capacity for risk taking that most of them were pretty savvy already because you had to be dancing through this very intricate blockchain virtual world in order to be able to even understand how to acquire it. There was something in the vision behind it that people could recognize, and they bought the magic beans and, and had the goose laying the golden egg now. That's a great uh, amplification because I, I think that vision is often connected with intuition. So yes, there's knowledge there, but there's ability to sort of see something in the future that hasn't materialized yet and to to know that you can believe in it. And I, I think that Jack is an image of that. I think that, you know, if I were going to guess Jack's typology, he was a strong intuitive and his mother was not, you know, she was sensate. She's like, we need milk, God damn it. You know, and, and the importance of both of those things, because the truth is that, you know, Jack's incredible intuition that allowed him to, you know, make that purchase would never have amounted to anything if it hadn't been for his mother throwing the beans out the window. So you need both. You need the big intuitive vision. And Joseph, just as you're saying, these people knew a lot. They were savvy. They did their homework. Now, it still was a risk, obviously. 
Sure. But but to have both of those things, to be able to have a belief in something big that other people might say, well, that's nuts. But then to also ground it in, in sensate reality. It's the combination of those two things that can be really valuable and guard against, you know, being taken advantage of uh, as as one is when one is overly gullible. So in a way, I think we're circling back to the four functions uh, that you've mentioned, Joseph, and is uh, really integral to Jung's thinking of the thinking, feeling, sensate, and intuition, that we have uh, intuition about cryptocurrency or magic beans, gets grounded in sensate stuff, gets grounded in the thinking and fact-checking, and that, that gut feeling of all four things have to come into play or have space. We have to have space for them to come into play. That is, um, I think, very interesting, Deb. I, I don't know there, whether there's research on it, but when people come into an opportunity where there's a risk of gullibility, hmm. are they relying on their inferior function to make a decision mm -hmm. instead of their superior function. So for instance, if somebody is a very, very strong thinking type and they wind up meeting a partner who evokes powerful emotional feelings, often the feeling states can sweep them into a relationship, even though their thinking function is saying, this is not very compatible. We have nothing in common. You know, <laughs> there's all kinds of strange circumstances around this. But the strength of the inferior function tosses them into something which often doesn't work out because rationally they predicted all of these problems. But depending on what your inferior function is, this can happen. Here's another example of that. A friend of mine who is uh, a feeling type, strong, strong feeling type and lovely, good friend of mine, and uh, she used to work as a hairdresser. And people loved her because she was so warm and relative um, and people told her all of their secrets. So she dated a fellow who was a strong intuitive type and was involved in the kind of new age communities. And he brings her over this VHS tape to view because there's an overwhelmingly amazing opportunity, investment opportunity. And that both of them should put their life savings, you know, into this thing. And so she's really excited. She's viewed it several times. Her intuitive boyfriend is really excited and they're getting ready to go. And so I said, oh, okay, you know, I'll, listen, I'll watch the videotape. And so this guy comes forward and he, he starts the lecture talking about superconductors and various substances that are superconductors of electricity, which of course makes him seem like a thinking type and makes him seem like an expert. Now, to my friend who's a strong feeling type, her thinking function is her inferior function. It's not her strongest function. So when people come forward and they sound very erudite and very sophisticated, that can create a lot of credibility. And then somewhere in the middle of the tape, he's raising money because he believes that he knows the secret to create a superconducting powder. And the powder can just be sprinkled down these long channels. And just sprinkling it down, it's going to conduct this unlimited amount of electricity with no loss as it's being transmitted along. And of course, he's wrapping it in all of this pseudo electrical engineering language. And at one point he says, and I want you all to know that this is a philosophic substance, but really once we develop it and it's, and it's only, you know, $25,000 to come in, we'll be able to create this philosophic substance that will revolutionize <laughs> the world. And then he says, and it's the same thing that the saints produce, you know, when they create the booty out of the air. And bop, 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 bop. Oh and it kind of goes on and on. Then he wraps it around with more scientific language. And so, you know, she's there with me watching it now for whatever the fourth time. And her eyes are big as saucers. And she is 
just amazed. This is the thing. Wow. This is going to be her cryptocurrency or her magic bean. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, and not like I'm not a noodle head sometimes, but even I could say, you know, investing your life savings in a philosophic substance. I don't know if you heard him say that in the middle of, in the middle of this, that it's, it's actually this kind of strange alchemical language that he's woven into this pseudoscience. And I have no doubt that sooner or later, this guy is going to wind up in jail <laughs> for stealing a bunch of people's money. So it took her a while. She said she was really sure I was wrong. Wow. I mean, this, and this goes to confirmation bias mm -hmm. that her feelings and the fact that her boyfriend, who she really, really liked and wanted to please him, yeah. she really wanted to join him in this extraordinary venture that they were going to be in. It's a little bit like the Emperor's New Clothes. It really, really was. Mm -hmm. Thank God, <laughs> you know, after really, um, having to spend a lot of time creating some heat in the conversation, wow. a little bit of doubt could kind of creep in to her mind as she was able to save what small life savings she had. Oh my God. But boy, she was ready to sign. Anybody with a scientific background would have laughed at this VHS. But again, you've got a feeling type thinking isn't their strength. So you mm -hmm. may turn it into pseudoscience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our inferior functions, as you were saying, Deb, are really the way in yeah. to people's weak spot. I'm also thinking about how easily uh, we can regress uh, to an earlier stage of development. And we all have that capacity all, all the time. Those early layers of our development are still there and available to be tapped and the kind of egocentrism or subjectivity that a child has, you know, we call it magical thinking, that if I think something and if I feel something, uh, then it must be so, uh, versus what we learn later, which is a more objective uh, stance as well. So I think both the inferior function and that that layer of the psyche that we all still have uh, that is uh, magical, that two things that are not connected seem connected in the child's mind. You know, my teddy bear uh, is a protective uh, thing that wards off uh, any kind of nighttime monsters. And if I, that child cannot go to bed without the teddy bear. And it, it translates over to this, uh, you know, sort of con man kind of thing that if it sounds right and he's persuasive and he uses all this fantastic language, then those two things are connected, philosophic sub substance and, you know, the benefits of investing. So I think it goes to say that all of us can be vulnerable to gullibility depending on how cunningly information is brought in through our least developed parts of our personality, mm -hmm. that there's an enormous amount of pressure to go along with the community that we're in, that if everybody seems to believe something, this confirmation bias allows us to believe it. What we're knowing about the, for instance, YouTube algorithms, where once we start watching something, the algorithm feeds us more and more information that continues to reflect our levels of interests, which gives us a false sense that a huge community agrees with us. And that has a powerful influence on us. And then our refusal to be introduced to our own complexity and our shadow allows us to not see the shadow in other people and then to succumb to the nefarious plans of people around us, which is actually just part of the complexity of the world. So maybe it's time to turn to a dream. And before we read the dream, I just would like to tell everyone that you can go to our website, thisunionlife.com. There's a button. As soon as you come to the first page, you can click and you can submit a dream also for possible interpretation on a future podcast. Wonderfully, we have heard from people whose dreams have been selected. And overwhelmingly, 
people have found it really useful, despite the fact that we don't know who they are. And that speaks to the universals that we find in dreams and how looking at these themes can really change our lives. And that inspiration helped us found Dream School, that we understand the universal value of dream work. And now, in a very accessible way, you can join Dream School. Going to the website again, click on Dream School, poke around, check out what we're offering, and I hope that you'll find it as useful as many people have thus far. Hey, Lisa, what's been going on about your book? Well, as you know, my book, Motherhood, Facing and Finding Yourself, was published in May of 2021 by Sounds True. And since it's been published, I've been feeling most excited and grateful reading the reviews for the book on Amazon and Goodreads. It makes me realize that this journey, which began as a challenging personal inquiry for me, has become a real healing force for many. Motherhood won the Parenting and Family category of the Best Book Awards this year through the American Book Fest, which has been exciting too. But what really feels nourishing to me as an author is hearing what's happening on the ground in people's hearts. And so many people have written to me on email or on social media and let me know how much the book has meant to them. And there's just nothing more gratifying than that, than to hear that the book has meant so much to so many people. So Motherhood is available wherever books are sold in paperback, ebook, and audio formats. And I hope everyone who's meant to dive into the well of its lessons can do so. And I so appreciate hearing from people what they think of it. So keep the emails and the letters and the comments coming. They mean a lot to me. There's also a free course that's related to the book and a book excerpt on my author website, which is lisamarciano.com. And I encourage all of our listeners to check it out. So thank you for asking, Joseph. I'm just uh, so happy for you. And it's such a lovely, lovely book, both deep and accessible about the inner journey around being a mother. It's never been written about. It hasn't been out there. And it's getting such an enthusiastic, heartfelt reception. It's wonderful. Yeah. I would love it if listeners who've read the book could write a review on Amazon because (laughs) although there are many wonderful ones there, um, more is always better. So thanks in advance for that. You've really incarnated something that was in the ethers but needed to be pulled down, needed to be shaped in words, and needed to be made accessible. Mm -hmm. And the proof in the pudding is that it's beginning to have a kind of life of its own in the collective. (laughs) That speaks a lot to the timeliness of this. Yeah, I think you're right, Joseph. The analogy to a baby is just too rich and too good and too multifaceted to be (laughs) missed. (laughs) It's having a life of its own, which is just what we want. That's Mm. right. So here's the dream we'll talk about today. A 27-year-old male works in public information and communications for a government agency. And he dreams. I'm in a shopping mall with my wife. We pass by a booth that is an archery range. And I notice on a sign that I can fire off one arrow for free. But as I grab an arrow... My wife rushes me along, and the booth attendant says it's not free. I'm disappointed, but return the arrow. We then immediately walk into a store. The merchandise is not apparent. And in a second, I'm leaving alone. As I approach the exit, I realize I have a golden blade, like a letter opener or small dagger. I think of returning it, but decide that, since I almost walked out with it accidentally, I might as well continue and just pretend that's what happened. So the streamer didn't give us any context. 
So this will perhaps be uh, an interesting exercise because we usually we have at least some associations, but it strikes me that we can still talk about this dream even without those because of the nature of some of the imagery. One thing that occurs to me is that in the first part of the dream, he's really disappointed that this desire has been stirred to fire this free arrow. Something in the psyche has tricked him and has blocked him from completing this thing he wants to do. And then he winds up, in essence, stealing something, another sharp object from a store, and for some reason feels entitled to that. So I'm wondering if there's some relationship between being deprived in the beginning of the dream and then feeling kind of entitled to be to receive something in the second half of the dream. Deb, you have a big smile on your face. What are you thinking? <laughs> well, I am thinking, um, I'll just go back to this psychic situation as it is, uh, which is usually presented in the dream setting of here's, here's the stage. The curtain has risen and our dream ego is in a shopping mall with his wife. Uh, and then, you know, an archery range. Well, those are uh, projectiles. We shoot arrows. There's an element of aggression, of penetration, uh, certainly in bow and arrow stuff. And his wife then rushes him along. She's not interested in this, and he has to return the arrow. Yeah. You know, and that's somehow such a wonderfully classic and mythic part of all kinds of stories of bows and arrows and projectiles of all sorts of things. And then the next thing is uh, he kind of accidentally, maybe accidentally on purpose, winds up with another object of aggression, uh, the letter opener or the, the small dagger. And, and this time, he might as well just keep it. He gets to hold on to it through subterfuge. And I'm I'm just wondering about the relationship with the wife, whether it's an inner wife or an external world wife, and his access to aggression. Well, aggression, and I would point out, thanks to our friend um, Freud, that arrows and knives are both very phallic. Ha. Huh. So <laughs> I think we're talking here about aggression, but I think may, we might be talking about something more like masculine potency, period. Yes. And in yes. fact, it may be that this dream is really about their sexual life. I'm not going to say that definitively, but I think that that's a possibility that he wants to fire one off. And his wife says, no, 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 we're not going to do that. But but I think in, in general, it would be too reductive to say it was just about sex, although I imagine that some of these dynamics may appear in the bedroom. But this more of this idea of masculine potency and the fact that he's 27, I mean, this is a time when I think a lot of men are challenged to really start kind of making their place in the world. So it, it's just, just right, I think, from a developmental standpoint. His, his wife and the attendant, I'd be so curious if the attendant is male or female, He's in almost a childlike position. It's like, oh, I want to fire this arrow. And the wife is like, kind of like the mom. No, we don't have time for that, dear. You know, and the attendant's like, no, 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 you can't have that. So it's it, it's kind of puts him in this childlike place. The interesting thing I, th I think about the, the, the golden dagger is it's gold. So it's of the self. And he thinks it might be a letter opener. So it may have to do with communication. Um, you know, the ability to make your voice heard. And and the thing about the, um, I like what you said, Deb, sort of like by accident on purpose, theft, is that theft in dreams and fairy tales is often a healthy, uh, represents a healthy impulse. That where we can't openly claim something right away, we claim it in a shadowy way. Yes. I was thinking about the um, book Iron John by Robert Bly. It builds on a Grimm's fairy tale. And uh, the task of the, of the boy is to steal the key from under his mother's pillow. And in this dream, in effect, he steals this golden dagger, 
which portends something very positive. Yes, I think it does. That it's it's golden uh, solar energy, something of value. Joseph, you're looking really pensive and thoughtful. What are you thinking? Well, I'm taking in and I I like the amplifications that you've brought in and it certainly begs a kind of Freudian um, reductive <laughs> analysis and I, I can totally understand that. I'm still caught up in this feeling in the dream that whether or not it's the arrow or the blade, that it needs to be free and without cost. Yes, I'm interested in that too. And I'm, and I'm finding myself thinking, well, why doesn't he buy it? Uh, does he not have the money to buy it? Does, does it make it more valuable because it's been stolen? But stealing it, let's just say it is a phallic capacity. Stealing it means that it must be hidden, that it can't be displayed, and that the use of it then becomes kind of compromised. So whether it's the penetrating arrow or the penetrating dagger, it's something that he's not going to be able to display. So I think this resistance to owning something, and whether it's the phallic potency, firing an arrow and hitting the bullseye has something to do with the volition and a demonstration of skill, just as you said, the golden blade can open letters and reveal information. It can also be used for protection and all the other things that we might use a blade for. But that these various capacities are compromised because it doesn't occur to him that he's then just going to pay for it so he can shoot the arrow and pay for it so he can walk out with the blade. So my question to him would be, where's your sense of resources to be able to make a fair exchange? And and my intuition about him wanting it all to be free, this is just this is just my wild hair intuition, is that it has to do with possibly making his wife unhappy. That if he were to claim his masculine potency, the cost of that would be uh, a different kind of relationship. And he doesn't want to have to bear the cost of displeasing, probably probably his wife, but probably other people too. That really claiming the dagger, really owning the dagger, you're not always going to be the nice guy. Some people are going to be unhappy with you if you wield your dagger around. And and he he doesn't want to have to pay that cost. It goes to to the idea of dangerousness, right? That there's something about a man's particular development that he needs to be able to own his shadow. He needs to be able to own his capacity for dangerousness in part so that there is some choice around it and he is not mistakenly dangerous because he's not tracking it. But also when somebody has access to their own sense of dangerousness, it grants them a sense of confidence and resilience. So I like what you're saying about this ambivalence around the female figure, whether it's the inner wife, the anima, or the external wife, that there's a fear of potential conflict there. And also this resistance to really owning the fact that one could hurt if one had to, or hunt if one had to. You've been listening to This Jungian Life, from our website, thisunionlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this union life.